Right, welcome back to episode four of Crucible Boot Camp. Once again, I'm your host, King Koala, and today we're going to be checking out some skirmish gameplay uh, sent in to me by a user named Rivazone. If I butchered that, I'm sorry, but my pronunciation of the English language isn't the greatest, so you can deal with it. Uh, today we're mostly going to be covering uh, the concept of pace and what it means to push pace and what it means to slow down. So when you're playing with someone um, that's used to uh, sweats, especially, or even in trials when you get an orb down, um, once you get a numbers advantage, you gotta speed up the game. You wanna finish out the enemy team as fast as possible. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about uh, what it means to get angles and what an angle is and how to be effective at getting angles. I feel like that's a buzzword that should be defined. And I'll have one new acronym for you guys, uh, some simple ABCs. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is a threes game. He's in a fire team. I think he's just solo queued in skirmish right now. So right off the bat, when he spawns in the war on cauldron, when he spawns in the cauldron, he's going to push into B and scope A door. Um, this is a pretty good angle from his perspective because uh, he can see com pretty much completely outside of this door as soon as it opens up, and most enemy players will open the door for you. Or you can have a teammate push up to the corner, either left or the right side, open it up and immediately back out to kind of bait grenades into the B area. It's a great spot for a sniper because from their perspective looking in, they're pretty much only going to be able to see your head, maybe some of your shoulders. Um, depending on where you are behind this coffin. So it's very it's a very strong place to open up the match on. You don't really need to move much here. Um, the pace of the game generally when when all three members are up of the enemy team is to kind of slow play until either you make a mistake and they punish you for it or they make a mistake or you get a pick and then you put need to start moving a lot faster. So his teammates kind of relay some information and he pushes back to get this challenge. Uh, he sees that the enemy player pulls out that sniper, so he immediately backs off. That's a great play that, because he realized, you know, he got some spray down. He got him with maybe six or seven bullets, and he still has to go through uh, nine or ten more just to get a kill. The guy has a sniper on him, and he already bodied him once, so dipping back into cover is definitely his best option. Uh, he did something that a lot of players don't do with their grenades, um, and that's he primes his escape route. So if the enemy player pushed up into him with that grenade that he threw onto the wall, it's going to be really difficult for him to properly go around this corner without immediately dying because of how low he would be from that grenade. Um, if you're not going to use your grenades to kill, you should be saving them as a way for you to escape. If he was a Sunsinger at this point, even firebolting him while he's red, red barred like this um, would, would have been very effective. So his teammate gets a pick and he's pushing back out to support his teammates. He does this a lot. Um, he, he supports, he's constantly moving back and supporting teammates. And I don't have the audio up, but they're constantly giving each other call outs of, of where they're at and where they're moving to. So the first thing I want to note about skirmish matches, especially, um, is that when you get team wipes, uh, people are going to spawn the furthest distance away from you, uh, on the map and that's sort of the algorithm a bunch of uses is you want to be as safe as possible with as much time between uh where you're currently at and where you're spawning for you to kind of be able to adjust to getting a new angle or um, not immediately getting killed off spawn and so knowing this you want to immediately push where you predict they're going to spawn in this case they all died on a ramp so they're likely going to spawn either in pool room, where the heavy spawns, or back in bones, which is where C is. So he's going to push around and push bones. So he's a sniper, and the best thing about a sniper is that the angles that you get in order to properly challenge someone after coming off a of spawn are much further away than if he was running, say, a pulse and a shotgun, where his optimal one-hit kill range is mid to close distance. This way, with a... With a soul stealer's claw and his sniper, his kill distance is it's a 
is much greater. So it gives him a better opportunity to not over push necessarily into the enemy team, especially if they all spawn at once, which is something if you're working as a team in skirmish or salvage, you should be aiming to, to spawn all at once because that way the algorithm that spawns you is going to end up spawning you in the same location all together so you don't get split and getting split is like is the worst thing that can happen to you as a team especially against good players because they're gonna they're gonna know this and they're gonna push you 1v1 or or num in numbers advantages so as i said they did spawn in in bones room and there's two there basically as soon as they spawned so they killed him bones are likely gonna spawn in ace a stairs so he challenges this he goes to second peak uh I wouldn't have second peeked at all. I would have skated across behind lamp to get a better angle because this angle down to down to um, the the a ramp is pretty difficult to snipe blind trying to peek back around that corner because there is the op opportunity for your enemy uh, to dip down into cover and to get a better head glitch on you, whereas you're coming back from the exact same angle. So this this is dangerous. Like they they know they know there was a guy down and they probably pushed him off. But if you weren't together as a team in this and you were just solo, then that was a very difficult repeak. He gets a nice kill and then gets blinded, pushes back into cover. Um, that's the the best part about getting flash banged. Uh, is actually it's it, it it's a chance for you to understand where your surroundings are. Uh, if he didn't know that he was going to be behind cover, he could have been punished for getting blinded. But um, Riv Rivy's a pretty good player, as, as far as I could tell from this clip. So they called out that he's probably on stairs. He gets a free pick, and then he immediately pushes. He knows that his, the enemy teams are in, in this pool room. After that call room, so he pushes up to it. And they're both hard scoped down there. So he got shot. He got lucky that he didn't get immediately picked off because there were two snipers uh, sniping that angle. Um, if you're going to push doors like that, then you need to be hopping over them or sliding through them. Um, in this case, he got lucky that he didn't that his feet were on the ground and he didn't get picked because it allowed him to skate backwards back into cover. And he's he's very smart about this. He goes to cover his flank instead of trying to wait for them to push into him and he punishes the guy trying to flank them. His teammates capitalize on that. They get a free pick. And then they just clean up the third guy. So again, we see him play kind of passively while they're spawning. And then once they get kills, they go to finish off the enemy team. And then they push back to where they're going to spawn. Okay, so here's the problem with knowing where people are going to spawn. I'll back that, back that death up for a little bit. So they just killed them in bones and in pool room. So they're likely going to spawn on ramp. And then outside, uh, let's I think it's C Bridge. I think that's what it's called. I don't know all the callouts on this map yet, but uh, knowing that you you it's likely that someone's going to be in in the B circle room, and then someone's going to be out on the ramp. And knowing that once you round this corner, there's going to be someone in B. He takes that shot and misses. But instead of dipping back into cover because he's challenging from an area where he's completely open. His real only his only good option is to do this kind of weird skate to throw his aim off. But the problem is with the skate, and you could have this maneuver if you're any class, is that you're going to completely expose yourself to where you think they're going to spawn across. So he just gets crossfired there. Uh, and something I took notes on here is if you note the time here, nine minutes. At nine minutes, that's when special spawns. So not only did he know that they were likely going to spawn in these locations, but also there's a box out here where the guy just killed him is. So, and he didn't wait for necessarily wait for special himself. So he's going to be special starved potentially um, if his team doesn't properly control the boxes or wait for him to get up to pull them. And as a sniper, that's that's a real issue because uh, sometimes your primary just won't cut it when you're getting team fired down. Sometimes you, you have to have that that power shot to be able to even the odds. Um, so it's kind of a double mistake. Not only did he know they were going to spawn here and he kind of pushed into them, but he wasn't aware of what was actually happening in, in the match. And I'm, I'm, 
I don't want to put him down, but I'm actually kind of glad he died there because that's a great opportunity to kind of understand game flow and that the game will drastically flow, especially in sweats where you don't pick up heavy, depending on when special spawning or what point of the game it is as far as supers go. So he spawns in and the enemy team is pushed into them at this point. So this is the enemy team making a good play, pushing into him as he's spawning. And they've probably been pushing since he was down earlier, since he took so long to pick himself back up. Um, when you die in areas where there isn't a real great opportunity for you to get picked up, it's best that you just mash your square button and get yourself up as fast as possible. Um, even, even if his teammates had managed to push out into the the a area and kill the or maybe push around through bones into b and kill that guy he he's still not in a great position to be rezzed so at that point he's just wasting time and not really providing the boost of 50 extra points um normally you want to stay you keep your orbs there if people are still fighting because you never know if someone's gonna clutch out a team wipe or there's just two men up and they're just gonna kill the other guy and it's gonna be extra points and when you play against good players, uh, every point matters. And I've seen matches come down to the wire where the enemy team has less kills but twice as many revives as you, and those points add up into kills. Every two revives they get is basically a kill. It's 100 points. Um, so every time that you pick yourself up that you don't give an opportunity for your team to res you, that's half a kill that you're just giving to the enemy team. You're letting them close the gap if they're... If they're behind you, and you're letting them get away from you, if the, if uh, if you're behind, so you want to be patient on your orb and evaluate the situation before you pick yourself up. This is another opportunity for both of them should be picking themselves up, which they do, because they are surrounded in pool room. So he spawns. They know they're in pool. Um, in skirmish and in salvage, when you die and you know where someone is, you basically have two options. You pick to go where you think they're going to move or you you think they're going to stay there so you move around to surround them. Um, this is especially good on small maps like Cauldron because the surround is very easy and it's very quick off spawn. It's difficult to make a play of a surround when you're on a larger map like Twilight Gap or Widow's Court or Blind, uh, Blind Watch which isn't played much in Sweats but um, you get the idea. The longer it's going to take you to get us around, the more likely you are to move to locations where you predict people to move, as opposed to where they current or were before. So, I liked the idea behind this play that he makes, where he's pushing with the super and he relates that to his team. But, and he knows he knows his limits because he, uh, you notice he's running shockwaves and the shockwave just barely misses. The problem with pushing like that as a titan, as a striker titan, um, if you're going to kill with your super and not shut down a super, is that you have you absolutely have to do it where you're not going to get fired on uh, before you get to that point. Um, if I didn't know that he was communicating with his team that he was going to use the super, it would look like a panic super because he got caught out in the open. Um, knowing that he's communicating with his team, if you are going to make this push... It should be from around the pool room, around that back alley, because that's going to provide you the greatest amount of cover before you actually get shot. And if you do round that corner and start getting shot, you can dip behind the lamp and there's a little wall there. You can use those to your advantage and get up in the air, which is going to increase the space you can cover with your smash. If you just smash straight on the ground, um, unless you're running headstrong, it's not going to go very far off the ground. Whereas if you're in the air, you have that momentum from skating. You're going to be able to close that gap, uh, confuse your opponents as far as how their aim goes, because most people don't just aim straight in the air. And it's going to give you a better opportunity to survive. This is also another reason why I like running death from above, because if I was running death from above, even if I push through that door with the juggernaut shield and jump straight into the air, I'm going to be able to get that double as opposed to how he had to hope that they stayed in range for a shockwave to actually go out and kill them. But because he did communicate this with his teammates, they were right there to support. Instead of this turning, uh, 
changing from him killing a guy and them getting two guys down and then cleaning up this this third kill um it could have been a a trade and then they go up 50 points because they get a res but his teammates were there to support and so that's that's how you should be utilizing your supers uh, even if he whiffed it if they still manage to get two kills off of it that's a super that's worth 200 points obviously if you get the kills with it it's worth more because super kills get bonus points but your super doesn't necessarily need to com to convert into direct kills but it does need to convert into indirect kills or map control at the very least if it doesn't convert into map control that's a wasted super if it's no kills and no map control then you should have held on to it so they have a nice challenge here his timer runs out so he just picks himself up this is a uh, a pickup group or a, a solo game so heavy is involved which isn't a big deal i mean they get a couple they get a couple double kills with the heavy there isn't much to talk about with heavy other than if you have a machine gun then you can't just run out straight into in into people expecting to win every gunfight especially when you're playing against shotguns and sniper rifles um until lesser extent fusion rifles anything that's going to one hit kill you uh, within the time that it's going to take for you to kill someone with your machine gun is going to be a heavy threat to you so you have to be careful um, if you're not using rockets and you're still going to pick up heavy so in, in most cases it's going to be in trials if you do sweats often if not um, i still recommend using a rocket launcher it's generally easier and safer to get kills it's easier to shut down a super with rockets than it is with machine gun So they kind of get pinched, but uh, and he, he's constantly pushing back into his teammates. You notice that he's never really that far away from his teammates. I know that this is a small map, but even on small maps, it's easy to find yourself alone if you're not really paying attention to your surroundings. So you see the enemy teams got wiped. They're just going to get double res, and they're going to push again. In this case, they could probably they could be split spawn, they could be bones, they could be pool room, they could be back A stairs. Yes, a very nice snipe on him. Goes for the challenge. Gets blinded again, but this time that he got blinded, he had no idea where his cover was. So he just got pushed and he died. So he sees he's in pool room every time you die and the other person is still up you need to make sure you know exactly where they are you need to relay that to your team if possible and you need to get an angle on uh where they're going to move so as a sniper on cauldron it's really nice that he's challenging these doors and that's what you want to do on a sniper as a sniper on small maps um especially like firebase or cauldron or anomaly these these maps that have very tight choke points you have to get comfortable challenging these these really close shots and most of the time you're just going to go for a body which is okay um even if you don't clean up the kill yourself or you only have time to get a body and you need to move away uh you can relay that information to your team and they'll be full health and they'll be able to challenge from a different angle or from the same angle So he gets a tag here, and he knows he gets a tag all the way back here. You see the little number, and there's a second guy in front of him, and he's less than half health. Um, this is just kind of poor awareness on his part. He goes to challenge this guy that's full health and just dies. But his team clean it, cleans it up for the win. Uh, overall, I thought this was a very good game um, in general, and I did listen to this game. Uh, the callouts were pretty good. You guys' teamwork was very good. Um, I think I believe all these guys are on the Slack, so you guys played very well together. Um, but as a sniper, I would have liked you see to see you play a little bit more passively to get the kills that you did. 
Um, some of them are really nice. Like you, you definitely knew where they're going to spawn and you pushed to it properly. But a lot of these challenges that you made uh, were generally out in the open. Um, the ones that are okay to be out in the open or with the radar traps you made around around Doris, you I noticed that you were standing straight up pretty much all the time you were sniping. And so the risk that you run standing up like that, especially on a, a small map, is potentially getting slid into and getting shotgunned or even getting fusioned. Um, so when, you, when you're challenging these radar traps, be aware that if you're in a location where you can get slid around a corner onto, it's probably better that you back up a little bit and either stay standing up or crouch down. Um, your movement on this map, while it was good pushing the spawns, it was not good as far as Titan skating went, and I think that's just an uh, being uncomfortable skating on a small map. Um, most of the times that I play on a small map, my skates are very short. They're short bursts. But skating in short bursts is still going to be faster than sprinting. And um, especially on small maps, you have to integrate slides. Um, you could have potentially caught a lot of players off guard for them being impatient. For example, when there were two people in pool room sniping you, you could have potentially slid in, skated backwards after you saw them, and then just waited around the lamp for them to push into you. Um, because at that point, you're pretty you're pretty safe, and you can stay crouched, could kind of blip on radar to pull them into you, because they're going to think you're further back. If you're blipping, uh, then a person is likely going to think you all the way back on a ramp, and they're going to prepare for you on a ramp. Whereas... As soon as they round that corner, you're going to be able to get either a free snipe or some free primary shots uh, on on them as they round the corner. And then also, you are running lightning grenades, so you could have covered uh, you could have covered those those entrances very easily. But like I said, in general, it was a it was a very good game. Um, I didn't have a, a ton of bad things to say about it, which is refreshing. It's always nice to see once people do things right, as well as help them when they do things wrong. All right, so let's talk about Cauldron and what it means to get angles. And so I'll also be using this fun Destiny callouts visualization because this map really sucks. So I'm really glad I have these visuals. So we'll go back to the example of pushing the orb inside. Okay, so. After you've started the game and you've pushed in inside of the 50-50, let's say you've gotten this orb down with a snipe. Uh, generally, you can do two, one of two things. You can have these three players push inside as a team, but you run the risk of getting con like instantly grenaded, whether that be with an incendiary or a lightning grenade or anything like that. Uh, what I like to do is I like to push two people in there because it's going to be a 2v2 and have one person flank these directions. Uh, the person that does end up flanking needs to be a titan, because if you're not a titan, you're going to get to these doors uh, way too late, and the enemy team that's going to spawn outside, he's going to have time to push inside, and he's going to be able to, to reinforce his team. So if you're not a titan, you basically have to push in, in as a full team, um, or just leave them alone and reposition. So if you do let them spawn in and reposition, the best way to reposition is to actually move into multiple locations. Um, one person can stay here, one person can go around here. You basically want to be aware when you move to these multiple locations uh, that you can potentially be all pushed together as a team because everyone in here is grouped up. But the advantage of this is you are going to attack them from multiple angles. So it's going to be it's going to be easy as long as you coordinate to pick at least one person off, whether it be with a grenade or just somebody pops in with a with a quick snipe or anything like that. So let's say you don't want to go to the 50/50 in this case. Um, and you're everyone's just spawned in. Because the map's so small, uh, this map isn't great at 
controlling areas. As far because if you control a zone, it's going to be really easy for them to just push and surround you, like I said earlier. So if you're not going to go to the 50-50, you have to attack from multiple directions or rotate around the map as a team or through here. Because we know the 50-50 is the lane of traffic, the major lane of traffic, controlling B room is actually the most important thing about this map. You don't necessarily need to be there, but you need to control how people move through that room. So what does that mean as far as how the game will play out? Well, as I said earlier, when you get downed orbs, on small maps especially, you get the opportunity to push spawns which you should be doing every single game, even solo. I would say especially solo because you can kind of, it's normally safe to assume that because you can't talk to your teammates, everyone on your team, including yourself is an idiot. So you should always be making the best average play at all times. And the best average play at all times is gonna be if you kill someone, you push the spawn. So in this case, you have to be really aware of uh, your location versus where the enemy location is. So if you have a down dorm here, like I said earlier, you're gonna spawn out here. But as, hap as what happened in the video a lot, let's say the enemy's here and here and here And you're here, here, and here. So let's say these players surround this guy and kill him. So you have two players in, in pool room and one player in B. They're likely going to spawn back here on A shelf or on, on A ramp. So the way you would push in this particular instance to get an angle is you'd go through into red room from pool and you try to cover, you'd either try to kill this guy or if he pulls back, you're gonna have a nice long sight line to get them from these two players here. This third player has, especially if you're a sniper, but also if you're a shotgunner because there's a lot of cover to go from B room out to seven, is you can push out if you're a sniper onto bridge to get him off the, off the res which is something that will happen on small wraps. It, it's, it's fast enough that you can push to a location where you can actually snipe someone when they res. And that's just how it will always be and how it should be. You should be, if you're good enough, you should be able to control spawns on small maps. If you're a shotgunner, you can move down here, up on a diving board. There's all these rocks here you can move around. But you wanna push the pace of the game to move faster and faster because as the game starts moving faster, you get more and more opportunities to split your opponents apart. Um, this is very difficult to do on small maps. So on small maps, there's a different strategy called setups, which uh, a wonderful guy named Fizzer covered very well on some of his videos. If you have a chance, you should go check some of them out, um, especially on maps like Widow's Court or Rusted Lands. There are ways that you can have players on the map so you, the enemy team always spawns in the same direction and they always have to push into you from the same angles. And it's very easy to cover those angles based on your weapon loadout. But on small maps, you get the opportunity to push spawns. And so by the time the game is midway through, as long as you're playing as fast as possible and you're constantly pushing people off their spawn and not giving them a chance to breathe, uh, yes, you'll be split up as a team, for the most part, or you'll be moving in pairs, but you can basically kill someone over here. The next guy's gonna spawn over here. You're gonna push him, kill him. Next guy's gonna spawn over here. These two are gonna push in and kill him. And then it's gonna flip and you're gonna do it all over again, except this time, they're just gonna be on the other side of the map. They're gonna be in pool room and bones. An A, even if they're together, 
you're just gonna rotate back and it gives and on small maps small maps is great because it gives you a lot of opportunities to engage in in 1v1s um, it's generally once you start getting uh, spawn traps going down and you're just constantly pushing into people you're not going to have an opportunity really to group up with your team you're constantly going to have two three three people in your face um, on smaller maps you can generally just burn your super whenever it's up um, unless you really really need to stop some some kind of big super like a storm caller um, but like a radiant skin on the smaller map isn't going to be as effective just because you can just wait out the radiant skin and all spawn together so what do you do if you're spawn trapped if you're constantly getting killed off spawn so if you're constantly split up you really have to understand uh, how to move around the map in such a way that you're not going to run into people or you have to find unique places on the map where you always get first shot off. And there's always going to be those places on the map. Most of the time they're head glitches, but sometimes there's really weird environment things that you can do to give yourself an advantage. On this particular map, there's a, there's a couple. Um, way out here, on this back wall, although you're kind of trapped out here, it... What someone will push in into this open area to try to find you, and that gives you a good opportunity for a free pick. I'm not saying like you should constantly be using these areas, because most of them are very you're very vulnerable. But if you're in a position where you basically can't move around the map anymore and you have to wrest control of the game and the pace of the game back from your opponents, this is this is an okay place to go just because it's generally open from bones out to you. And you can post up on bridge underneath it, especially to kind of cover this door pushing out into you. So that's one way you can you can kind of slow the slow the pace of the game down. Another area you can slow the pace of the game down is there's this ring of crypts. You can pretty much jump on all of them. So if you have a warlock or a titan, you can jump on one of these, and you have a great vantage point uh, over the doors that push into this room. And also, you can shoot all the way down here. So, this allows you to get a pick. You can't, like I said, you can't always go go in these locations. Um, another example on a different map would be the on top of the tube on Exodus Blue. Um, you can't always go there, but it does give you an opportunity to get a free pick or to or to cause a lot of damage when people are pushing you. Um, because you're really high up on here, it's really hard to grenade you. So you can actually, uh, in this particular instance, if you want, you can bait people's grenades really easily. If you have one person here, maybe they pop in and out of cover to be super annoying, and you have someone up here, and they're in B or in pool room, and they're grenading into here. Once those grenades are down, that's basically your opportunity to push as a team into someone. So even if this person here gets tagged, let's say this person on lamp gets tagged from B room and they're going to push through B room to kind of finish them off. They're all going to funnel through this choke point and if you're sitting up here on this crypt, you're going to get free shots on everyone that comes out of that door. If you have a super, uh, like like a, a smash in this case, uh, that's pretty much going to be a triple kill or at least a double as soon as they come out of there. Yeah, this guy's going to be weak and maybe he'll even die, but you're going to trade one for three and get his res. So that's an excellent play to make. Um, on Trials, uh, because it is a lot slower play paced, this location, most players, players never go up there. So this is another great place to just get a free pick and win a round for free. Because even, even if you only go up there once, they're always going to be afraid of that spot for the rest of the game. They're always going to come to these stairs and check up there. And that brief check is going to give you enough time to move somewhere else. Or move in a location where um, it might be a little riskier for you to take a shot, but it'll be you'll be at less of a risk because they're spending time trying to find you when you can actually come around here and kind of try to get a snipe. Or 
head glitch on the lamp and try to get a snipe. Because they're too busy looking up here to try to stop you from cheesing at that point. I know that I've featured a lot of sniping uh, on here, but on a small map, uh, as I noted earlier, it's incredibly difficult to snipe because all of these distances, aside from this long lane here, are very, very short. Even this distance is relatively short for a sniper line from a door into ba the back of pool. So if you are going to snipe on smaller maps, and I would argue that Cauldron is the hardest map to snipe on, um, you have to be aware that almost all of your snipes and all the locations you're going to be sniping from are easily contestable and uh, easy to push with a shotgun because of how much cover there is. And how easy it is, especially out here at A and out here in, uh, on the green side, to get aerial and to just kill you flying above you. Uh, I, the worst possible spot to snipe on this map um, is probably this lane here. Anywhere along here, outside of the ramp, because you have no cover to move into. Um, if you're here and you're sniping back... This is pretty dangerous because this wall, uh, you can fly over it and you'll get flanked that way. Um, as a shotgunner, you're basically going to need to utilize movement through B to get the most out of this map. And so there's a lot of opportunity for really close quarters play even pushing by yourself into B, because you have this underneath area here. These are all lower elevations. You have this head glitch here that you can just hide on. You can corner crouch around these doors, and you're always going to know when someone's coming because they're going to open up the door. And as a shotgunner moving out of B, uh, into bones is relatively easy. This long lane here, it's pretty easy to shotgun anywhere down because there's so much cover you can dip in and out of. And like I said earlier, you can slide you can slide shotgun around all of these corners or through any of these doors if these snipers are trying to radar bait you into these locations. Like Rivy was standing here when he got this when he got a body shot on someone outside this door. If that guy was a shotgunner. You can just slide down and immediately kill him. This is this is the distance of a slide. You're dead if you're in this if you're in this position and you're trying to snipe. It's a little easier to snipe if if you're uh, back in bones because there's some ramps. This is all lower elevation. You can bait someone over to the special box and snipe across, or snipe any pushes this way, or gun down anyone trying to push up onto you from outside. So said so I wanted to talk a little bit about angles. So when you're pushing the pace of the map, uh, getting an angle on someone means that you're going to give yourself the best opportunity to shoot them as they move into you. Now that's an important point at the very end. Uh, they have to move into you in order for you to have a proper angle on them. If they don't move, you have no angle. The only time that it's going to work is if you predict where they move and they move there. So what what does that mean as far as you as a player properly moving around a map? Well, if you know where people are going to spawn, he's going to spawn out here on a, a, a ramp, and you're a sniper, you can go to lamp and you can snipe down here. That's a good angle. You're going to get the first shot off. But what if you want him to move into the open? What if this shot is too hard for you to make? And that could be a reality for some people. Maybe this shot is just too difficult for you to make. Maybe you're just better off when both of you are standing straight up. You don't have to be here. If you don't want to shoot this angle, even though this is a good spot, you don't have to be here. If you want them to be more in the open, that just means you need to readjust 
and get a new angle on them. So if you want them to want to pull them all the way to this position, you can just back up a little bit as long as you know where your escape routes are. And there's a, there's a corner here. You can just stand over here by the door. Maybe your teammates here so you're safe. I wouldn't suggest standing in front of a door, but from here, from these locations that I noted, you can notice that from these locations, you can't snipe down all the way down here on the ramp anymore. And that also means you're probably far enough away on radar that if you're here on ramp, you're going to think it's safe to push into this open area. And if you do push into the open area, like either you predicted them to or you want them to, these locations are going to be great angles for you to attack them. Um, in this particular instance, just jumping up on these crypts, like I said earlier, is a great angle for the open area. It's also coincidentally a great angle for this head glitch, but it's no longer a head glitch at that point because you have such a high vantage point that you're going to see them. You're going to see their entire body. It's going to be a lot easier for you to cover that. So here's the red room. So the head glitch, if you want to snipe red ramp, would be around this, around here, on this area here. And your head's going to be about here, and you're going to be able to snipe down under red ramp. You can also do it on the other side. It's not a head glitch, but you're still, you could still be covered. Half your body could be covered by this little protrusion. So this is, an, this is a great angle. You can go up onto these crypts up here, as you can see. They have little lips on them. You can jump on top of them and snipe down or use your primary. As you can see, if you're in green room or bones and you're back behind where this photo is taken, you can snipe across onto these green doors. You can snipe across on the green hall. You can cover these angles. So if you if you expect someone to push into you, into bones, just being on that back shelf where the, where the special spawns, this little cave area here, just on that shelf, you can cover that angle. Uh, generally, when you get angles, uh, you're not pushing into someone. You're just waiting for them to come to you. So that means if they don't come into you, you have to be aware that you need to rotate around the map to get a new angle where you think they're going to move to. So if you predict them to spawn here and they decide, well, I don't want to go to ramp because they're going to snipe me on ramp. They snipe me on ramp the whole game. I'm going to go to bridge instead. You have to readjust to where you th where they're going to go. Even if this guy is all the way over here, by the time you start moving, as long as you enter this and enter B before he's inside, you're going to be able to at least get a 50-50 on him, if not for a shot. And if you do, if you are a little late, and he's already inside, all you need to do is be aware of your escapes. So you need to be aware that I need to back up, or I can, I can go out through this bottom door, or I can be really tricky, and if I have a shotgun, I can bait him underneath. And just have, pull him into me. Small maps have the advantage for shotgunners that there isn't a lot of space for your opponent to move. So sometimes it's better just to wait for your opponent to push into you so you can kill them. You talk a lot, I'll talk a lot and a lot of people talk a lot about using cover in order to safely get to a person. But when you're a defensive shotgunner or a shotgunner that really relies on people's reliance on their radar and exploits people for that, uh, you can just crouch and wait for them to push into you. People pushing into you is the same thing as you gap closing into them. This is a the distance of a slide. So now you have one slide less to push into them. Potentially you can primary them down or you can, you know, then you can use more cover to get closer. Maybe you're underneath bridge and they're a shotgun or two. So if you're underneath bridge, and you both have shotguns. This is a... 
basically a 50-50 for either player. It's a little scary for the guy under the bridge, but if you position yourself properly, let's say you position yourself on one half of the bridge, you drastically increase your chances of getting this of killing this guy before he kills you, especially if he goes right and tries to check. As he's dropping down, you can slide into him. If he goes left and tries to check, you can you can create space in order to properly shoot him. As long as I mean and shotgunners have much higher they run on much higher sensitivity. So you if you practice enough, you're going to be able to whip around and and kill someone as they're dropping behind you. You just have to predict where they're going to move. That's basically a 101 on angles. Um, I'll go into a lot more depth on a lot of these concepts, but to start out with, I want to try to create a, a vocabulary so it's easier to um, talk about this stuff more in depth. Um, and the, the final thing before I move on to questions is a new acronym for you guys. So I'll go over the old one first for those of you that are new or haven't watched all the episodes yet. The first one was tar, and that's think act react so think about what you're going to do how you're going to move around the map what it means to get an angle which angles you want to cover which angles are going to be bad for you you want to act on that so you've thought about where you want to go now you actually want to go there you want to cover those angles you want to get those first shots off you want to grenade your escapes and then you want to react once you get there is anyone there do you need to reposition are you getting flanked are you getting swarmed are you surrounded already and then you just do it all over again so that's the first one next one is simple abc and that's always be checking so i've covered this a little bit in earlier episodes but i notice a lot that people don't keep track of their cooldowns and they don't keep track of their radar a lot of a lot of deaths that I've seen are easily preventable if you're just checking what you have up and checking your radar constantly just a quick glance at where your radar is. This is really hard to do on if you're using like really big TVs just because your the distance your eyes have to move is just so immense compared to if you're using a little monitor or a little CRT or whatever where you can just kind of do a quick check and then go back to business as usual. But you should always be checking and always be aware of your cooldowns, what's coming up soon, and relaying that to your team if possible. Or using that to the best of your advantages. Okay, so I will open it up to questions to you guys. Uh, if you have any questions about this map in particular, or a game mode, or whatever you want to ask, uh, the floor is now your guys's, and I will do my best to answer them properly. Okay, so first questions: What's the best frequency, and how much, or what information is most important for callouts? Uh, my philosophy on callouts is. You need to say as little as possible, but provide as much information uh, as, as possible. So in this case, I don't really like this particular set of callouts because they're so wordy. Um, like red cliff. I think this is supposed to be red plate, red pit. It, you, you can shorten that down to just pit. Um, the reason that these are that these are colored is because of the sides and they want to repeat but you should just be able to say pit or bones or altar and instantly know where your teammate is calling out whether they need help there or whether they need to move there or whatever um, the most important thing about callouts is to be constantly making them and that doesn't mean that you're only calling out enemy locations and this is something that i think a lot of players should work on myself included um, I'm okay at making callouts on where someone is. I can kind of generally, hey, you know, he's by the lamp. He's down on on a ramp. He's uh, out on on uh, heavy bridge. But it's where you move to that is uh, what people are missing out on. So I normally, if I'm consciously working at it, I'll normally say, hey, I spawned pool. 
I'm moving to Bones. That's all I gotta say. Two seconds, it's done. Doesn't really, you know, affect anyone as far as they're not gonna suddenly move to Bones uh, to support you unless they have to. But if they have to support you, they know, hey, he's in pool. I'm out here in Red Room on A. I know that if he's gonna move to Bones that I can move through pool because it's safe and support him or her. Uh, if I just spawn and move and then die and this person was here the whole time waiting for me, then, you know, now I'm down 100 points, possibly, potentially more. Or even if I trade, they're not necessarily going to be in, in position to help me out and support me. So the best frequency of callouts is... Just con it's it's constant. It, you should there should be constant chatter, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be talking. It should be relaying information, and then that's it. Even if it's just I'm fighting here. I, it's hard for a lot of people to walk and chew gum at the same time. I understand that, but at the very least, uh, if you're not calling out where someone is, you should be calling out when you spawn and where you're gonna move to. And then if there's if nothing's happening, say. I'm going to relocate. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. As long as your enemy or as long as your 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 allied your allies and your teammates know uh where you're going, then they can decide how they want to use that information and how best to move around themselves. And so then at that point you're just having a conversation on how to move around the map. And that conversation turns into rotations which is what you want to do as a team, is move around a map together or close enough that you can support each other once you get into trouble. So if I say I'm moving bones, he can say, okay, I'm going to support you through pool. If, if he just says, I'm, I'm going to go through pool, to me, that tells me that my back, my flank, is covered, and I never have to worry about that. From, from this point until he dies, I know he's behind me, or until he's in front of me. Then I know I need to go back to making sure that I'm checking my flank every so often. If he doesn't say anything, that I could be wasting precious time instead of getting a free snipe into B, I could be checking behind me just to double check to make sure I'm not gonna get flanked and picked off. So short, concise, and constant. That's what you wanna do for callouts. Uh, what would you say is the best way to go about finding a good angle? So. Angles are really complicated in that, like I said, it's how you think the enemy team is going to move into you. So you're covering a zone from one particular location. And that location is constantly changing based on how you think they're going to move. The better you are at predictive movement, the easier it is to get a, to get a good angle. Um, and a good angle, you always get first shot off. Or if you don't get first shot off, uh, it's easy to dip back into cover or it's easy to return fire with while still being relatively safe. So head glitches, almost always a good angle. Um, being really high or really low are almost always good angles because elevation changes mess with the radar. And if you're not familiar with your radar, you can actually manipulate that. Um, if you're below someone, uh, not on this map, but on other maps. If you're below someone, uh, let's say on Asylum. So we'll move this a little bit. Let's say on Asylum, we have Ticket Booth, and then there's like, you know, these doors here. There's like Ninja back here. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, you have this underneath area that kind of like loops around. And there's like these stairs that come here. If you're underneath and someone is on top, you can be really annoying with your radar and you can just be jumping up and down, flipping on the radar. Now they're probably gonna know you're underneath, but if you have someone push up at the same time, they're gonna have no idea what's going on because they think you're underneath. So they're gonna kind of peek down there and then they're gonna get picked off as someone comes up and pushes them. So 
even even using elevation to your to your advantage can be a good angle. Um, kind of to answer your question, the best way to get a good angle is to predict how your opponents are going to move. Um, so your follow-up question is how, what's a good way to go about practicing predictive movement? Um, the best way to practice predictive movement is to push spawns. Um, watching where people move off spawn is a good indicator of how they're going to move around the map in general. Uh, if they don't have perfect information of you. So what do I mean by not having perfect information of you? If you kill them in pool room and you know they're going to spawn out here on a shelf, they know you're in pool, so this is going to be off limits. A, normally a good angle would just be to push out and kill them off spawn. Because, but because they know you're here, this is no longer a good angle. A better angle would be to push into here and cover where you predict they're going to move, which is into B, because they think it's safe. If they do push into B, you know that they're on a second level of thinking. They know where you are, therefore you have to predict where they are, where they're going to move instead. If that happens, maybe they move to a third level. They think I'm going to go here, so I'll go here, but I think, because I know that I shouldn't go here, and I know that they'll push me here, Maybe I go all the way around instead. Or I push I actually push back onto the head glitch. And it's safe because I think you're gonna push into B, thinking I'm pushing underneath. There are levels to predictive movement that get more and more difficult the smarter your opponent is. It's just like poker. In poker, when you bluff, uh, or in my case I played a lot of magic. Uh, there are different levels you, that your opponent can be on. Level zero is always, um, I'm going to do whatever I want, no matter what my opponent thinks. Level one is, I'm going to do the one thing that my opponent doesn't think I'm going to do, and then so on and so forth. And it just becomes, well, I think you did this, so you'll do this, so I did this instead, so you did this instead. Uh, and the deeper it goes, eventually it loops on itself because it would cut... Uh, becomes too complicated for most people to keep up with and they'll default back normally to level one um this is all very like philosophical mind gamey stuff um but that's kind of how you have to work predictive movement is you really have to get into the head of your opponent and that's my favorite part of this entire game is predictive movement and understanding where someone's going to be because there's nothing more satisfying than as a titan I know they're going to spawn here, so I skate as fast as possible to the level that I think they're going to be moving at, and just immediately kill them before they had any chance of retaliation. And that's actually why I really like playing Titans, because it, as long as my predictive movement is good, my actual if my actual movement matches where I predict them, I'm going to be rewarded time and time again. The only thing that's going to hold me back is my own personal gun skill. Uh, the easiest way to gauge opponent's intelligence based on their actions uh, is if they go to the same place more than once. Uh, if they go to the same place more than once, you can generally assume that they're not going to try to bluff you and they're not trying to outplay you with movement, so you can always go to where you think they're going to move because they're constantly going there over and over again. Uh, the, the easiest example of this is Trials. Um, last, last episode, you noticed that, uh, people, like he, Punky just kept going and having the same opening over and over again. Um, I'm not going to say he's stupid, but the tactics he chose were stupid because it made him incredibly predictable. And so if I was sweating against him, I would know no matter what, if he was the one dead and the one spawning, I would know where he would go. Uh, how do you keep your callouts parsimonious? I don't actually know what that means, so I'll have to look that up later. And direct. I'm, a, I'm assuming that's short and concise. Uh, I have trouble conveying everything I see without taking time and making full sentences out of it. Uh, 
you just have to practice uh, two things. Who is it? Or how many there are? Who or how? How many? Uh, either one of those is fine. And then where? Um, so if someone is on uh, in B, let's say on altar, then I would say one altar. That's it. That's all you need to say. Someone is on altar. Maybe I managed to see who it is, or maybe I know there's only one hunter in this game and it's anklet. So I say anklet altar. That's it. Normally you're going to say, I see anklet on alt altar. You want to be grammatically correct, but time is of the essence when you're, especially when you're playing on small maps, because you don't know when you're going to get attacked. You don't know when you're going to gunfight. And like I said earlier, it's hard to walk and chew gum at the same time. So it, it's going to be weird at first because you're going to want to say more. You're going to want to give more information. You're going to want to say he's on altar and he's half health. Uh, or I'm fighting him right now on altar and he's going to move through here. Like you don't, you don't need to say that. You could just say anklet altar, move on or moving to bones and move on. Um, it's, it's really about just a conscious effort of making it short and concise. And it's not easy, and not everyone is going to get it. Um, but constant, constant practice, constant practice, and eventually you'll you'll drill it into yourself. Yeah, I uh, I've I'm glad you guys really enjoy it. Um, I'm really enjoying making these. Uh, it's definitely a nice break from reviewing my own stuff, and I know you guys get a lot out of this. And it's it's nice to be able to put into words some of these things that a lot of players know what's happening, like spawn like uh pushing spawns but not having the vocabulary or the concrete examples of how it works uh i'm at the point to where i'm constantly checking my ammo can that be useful or am i waste wasting precious time thinking time um so checking your ammo depends on the gun you're using. Um, so if you're using a shotgun, if you have, you should be aware when you go below three shots in your mag, um, because one shot per person on the team or, um, down to one, whether you have like a perk for like final round or something. Um, same thing for a sniper. If you go below three, you should be aware of that. Primaries, it really depends on how many bullets it takes to kill. Uh, on the last word, in general, uh, you're probably going to miss one or two shots, so you want at least six in the clip safely. Um, if you know which abilities uh, pair with your shots um, to get a kill, then you need to be aware of that. So in the example of a throwing knife, you need... Uh, uh, a body shot, I believe, and then a headshot with a throwing knife, or two body shots and a body shot with a throwing knife. If you're a striker and you have storm fist up, that means you only need one body shot and a storm fist to kill someone. If um, you have a grenade, uh, a firebolt, then you only need, I believe it's one body shot um, with the, the last word. I don't play Warlock, so if these are wrong, please feel free to correct, correct me. But uh, yeah, I believe you only need one body shot with the last word, and you'll get a kill with the uh, with your firebolt, the burn. Um, so knowing that, you can check your ammo to say, hey, you know, I only have two shots left, but I have this grenade up. So I know if I get one or two shots off, then I'm gonna kill them with my grenade. Or maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're low health and you don't have time to, to run away and hide. And you only have two shots uh, or you, let's say you have four shots in the mag in your, in your last word or three shots in your normal um, hand cannon. But you're being pushed. You know that your grenade does 85 damage as soon as it hits. So you probably got to get two headshots to kill them. And so you need at least two in the mag. Like these are, you, you should be aware of not only your ammo, but what that means in terms of how it, it, uh, it synergizes with your abilities. Even something as simple as storm trance. Um, let's say you've put some damage on them. Storm Trance ticks for 73, so you know it's going to take three ticks to kill someone. 
If you already have 70 damage on them, it's only going to take two ticks, so that's going to be even less time necessary to kill them. Uh, is this a good map to hold a zone da down a zone for rumbles? No. This is an awful map to hold down a zone for rumbles. Um, the reason for that is the best zones you can control are all open. Um, the one zone you want to control has five entrances into it. Uh, so the best zones to control, if you're going to try to control on Cauldron, um, as normal, they're going to be around special boxes. So there's a special box here, there's a special box here, there's a special box here. So that means you can control, um, the red room area, you can control the green outside area, you can control the green actual room. The, the zone you want to control is B. The problem with B is, we remember, there's all these angles that you can get attacked from. And in Rumble, everyone is against you, so you can assume every one of these angles has to be covered at one point or another, and you're only one person. And if you're in B room, you can't cover this with a sniper at all. You're all <laughs> like, you have to abuse the doors, and if you get one snipe on a door, you have to immediately whip around and be prepared to cover another door, because you've been probably been in your scope too long. Even if you've only been in your scope for two or three seconds in Rumble on a small map like this with five entrances to kill you from, that's too long. Uh, so on Cauldron, my personal suggestion uh, would be to rotate around the map. It's really easy to rotate around Cauldron. Um, it's so small that you're almost always going to run into someone every new room you walk into. There's going to be one person. There's going to be one person here. There's going to be one person here. There's going to be one person here. Someone's going to be in B. Someone's going to be out here. Maybe you're on a flag. You can just move around and kill everybody and then do it again because they've all spawned again. Cauldrons, if you want to practice rotations, Cauldrons the best map to practice rotations on because of how small it is and how you basically walk in a giant circle and getting uh getting angles on anyone is relatively easy due to the amount of cover that's in this game that's on this map okay so that's pretty much all i've got for you guys this week um as usual if you have uh, gameplay you'd like me to review I'm starting to run low so please send me more um, Saturday I am going to be re reviewing some of my own stuff so you guys will see uh, how I play and you'll kind of get an idea of, uh, of some strike you'll get some general striker tips and things like that um, again email it to keen koala at gmail.com um, my twitter is at keen koala and you can always go there to find out when the stream's going up um, if it's going to change times, if I have any clips or anything snarky to say to someone. Uh, and then the YouTube channel that all of these episodes are going to be uploaded to is Keen Space Koala. And you can search for that, or you, I believe you can search for Crucible Bootcamp and find any of the episodes. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you guys again on Saturday at 5. Koala out.